good morning mr acharya good morning mr dimbal good morning dr bera good morning sir uh, good morning yeah good morning everyone um so manoj mr arnab mr tapan yeah hello hello all of you <clears throat> Uh, uh, could you give the share permission of the presentation? Is it audible? Where is it? Yeah. Manoj, yeah. 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 Am I audible? Hello. Manoj ji, could you check? I am sharing a screen. I am sharing. It is full screen. Is it possible? Let me see once. हाँ सत्र लगाई फुल स्क्रीन हो रहा है ना जस्ट यस यस मिस्टर मनोज मनोज जी आप देख इट्स मूविंग इट्स मूविंग मनोज जी एमआई ऑडिबल yeah yeah hello manoj ji am i audible yes yes you are audible sir uh good morning everybody and welcome uh, for this uh, uh, webinar i will be talking on because i am out of station and in some uh, family function uh, manoj ji ed sir had just called me on uh, whatsapp and he told me that he is facing some problem in logging in so he has advised to start the webinar He is trying to join uh, as early as possible. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Please, sir. So, good morning, uh, all of you again. Uh, myself, Manoj Acharya from PCRA, and uh, uh, welcome you all to this webinar on uh, hydrogen fuel. Today we, we have. have uh, Uh, speakers from uh, I, IOC R&D, IIT Mumbai, and CST. The speakers from uh, IOC uh, is Dr. Tapan Bera uh, from IIT Mumbai, Dr. Arnab Datta, and uh, from CST, uh, Mr. Kishore Kumar. So to start with, I would request uh, Dr. Tapan to take over the stage and continue with his session. okay good afternoon uh, good morning everybody it's a thank you manoj ji for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of such a huge audience so let me share my presentation just uh, on this here so it is visible and audible i am audible right yeah yeah you are audible sir okay thank you very much 
and whenever uh, my uh, time is over, you just give an indication. I will I'll stop at the moment. Okay, sir. So let's talk about hydrogen actually. Uh, now hydrogen is widely regarded as a promising clean and efficient alternative fuel of 21st century and post petroleum era. It has the potential to reduce the threat of global warming while simultaneously guaranteeing energy sustainability and security. Sorry. An Indian oil R&D is pioneering the hydrogen and fuel cell research uh, in the last two decades, realizing the potential of this technology. So going to the next slide, actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So why we talk now on hydrogen? Because we have uh, limited reserves. And and uh, and we import uh, our country import 80% of the crude oil and 20 50% of the gases actually, so we need a sustainable fuel. And then uh, then uh, then the concern is the environmental concern, and and there is a fluctuating crude crude price. And uh, after COP26, uh, we all countries has committed to reduce their carbon emission. So in that respect, hydrogen has found uh, its its position as a fuel for the future. And if you see the journey of the mankind, we have reached to this stage after many changes. So change is constant. So although we are working uh, today, the carbon fuel like uh, gasoline, petrol, maybe in the new, near future, we will move to carbonless fuel. So what are the drivers of the economy, uh, hydrogen economy? The drivers are first is the emissions, CO2 emissions. We as a country we emit nearly 2.5 to 2.7 gigaton of hydrogen, which is 7% of the world. So we need to reduce the emission because we aspire to be net zero uh, net zero emission by 2070. That was the commitment of the, our government. Then uh, we, we uh, then the other point is the air quality improvement if you see the air quality index of delhi it is almost 15 times worse than the who recommended guidelines so these are the two main driving forces of of clean clean hydrogen economy then uh, why the technology has reached to the maturity actually because earlier also people are talking about hydrogen but those who are not thoughtful now you see the carbon capture storage technology cost has come down Renewable power cost has come down. So it is visible that hydrogen economy is possible at this moment, actually. So this is the journey of our, our fuel. We started with wood, then we slowly moved from coal to oil to natural gas. And now we are talking about hydrogen, actually. So from carbon, uh, carbonaceous fuel to carbon-less fuel, our journey, we are moving slowly, slowly. And we consider that hydrogen is the most uh, sustainable solution for new uh, for new future, near future, and to mitigate the climate change. So uh, let's talk about some color because people people are talking about color of hydrogen: gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, turquoise hydrogen, yellow hydrogen. These are the prominent colors. There are some other colors also. So gray hydrogen is the hydrogen which is produced by stream methane reforming of natural gas. And in our refinery, we produce gray hydrogen. And if you if you capture that hydrogen, then uh, you, it is called the blue hydrogen. And instead of uh, fossil fuel, if you use the renewable power to produce hydrogen, you call it green hydrogen. In turquoise hydrogen, we use methane pyrolysis or decomposition where the hydrogen is produced and carbon remains as solid actually. It is not emitted, so we, we call it turquoise hydrogen. This is at a lower maturity level actually. Uh, we are waiting for the breakthrough of this technology. Then if you use nuclear power to produce hydrogen, then it is called YOLO hydrogen. And people are working on high, high temperature electrolysis technology to reduce the cost. So this is a chart actually if you see the global hydrogen production. In 1975, in, uh, globally, the, about 19 say, to say, uh, 20 million metric ton hydrogen were produced. And, and, and currently, oil is produced 90 million metric ton of hydrogen. 
and this hydrogen uh, is almost produced from natural gas 76% natural gas is used to produce this hydrogen and 22% through coal gasification and this hydrogen is used mostly by refining industry and and fertilizer industry so so and and people are saying that annual growth of hydrogen demand will be like 7% and by 2050, demand will be like 560 million metric ton. So there will be a huge demand of hydrogen in coming future. This is global status. And if you see the current national status, as a country, we are producing like uh, 6.8 million metric ton of hydrogen. And this hydrogen is mostly produced by the refinery and the, and the fertilizer industry by steam methane reforming. And currently, we consume nearly 6.7 million metric ton of hydrogen as a country. And so there are some surplus capacity in the country, which can be used as hydrogen enabler. And we are working on that path also. I'll explain that. And uh, this is a demand growth graph, actually. If you we, uh, consider the growth rate about 5.5, even 5.5%. By 2030, the demand will be almost doubled actually. So, so there is a huge, there will be a huge market for hydrogen. So, with that background, I'll just uh, talk about, uh, speak on a little bit on hydrogen, how hydrogen can be produced, and then use of hydrogen in mobility sector, then what Indian oil has done on hydrogen area. And then we will conclude my presentation. The first uh, hydrogen can be produced from fossil fuel. So like reforming, steam methane reforming, partial oxidation or autothermal reforming and coal gas. This is the traditional route of producing hydrogen. Then, uh, excuse me. Okay. Then we can produce hydrogen by splitting of water, uh, by electrolysis of water. And there are different technologies like PEM, alkaline technology and solid oxide electrolysis technologies. But uh, if you use uh, renewable power, we, we will call it green hydrogen. Then, then renewable hydrogen is the hydrogen which is produced, uh, which use renewable power. Biomass gasification also we consider as, 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 as renewable hydrogen because the, the life cycle is very low. Uh, it's a carbon negative actually. And there are some technology like photocatalytic water splitting, photoelectrochemical water splitting, and uh, academics are working on the, this technology. But those technologies are still at uh, laboratory scale. And if you see the hydrogen value chain, it has be a very big value chain actually. Production is, is not only important, it's purification because you need 99.99% purity for use of hydrogen in fuel cell. Then its compression is costlier, then transportation is a challenge then delivery at, at site. So we need to work on each part of the value chain so that uh, hydrogen economy be feasible in the country. So this is one project we are working uh, in, in our refinery actually. So uh, where hydrogen will be produced from, uh, from renewable power. So this is some data actually. So where you can, uh, how you can hydrogen uh, produce hydrogen for, it requires like 50 to 55 unit of electricity per kg of hydrogen. And then you need water, like 10 kg DI water, deionized water, which in turn require actually raw water requirement is 22 kg water. So these are the requirement for, 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 for one kg of hydrogen production. There are some challenges actually, because still a continuous reliable mode of production of green hydrogen is not the, uh, foolproof actually. So we are working on that on demonstration part. Then large because your refinery need a reliable and uh, source of hydrogen. Then large throughput require. So gigawatt scale is still not validated. Then economic part actually they use some noble metal catalyst. Then OPEX is high. So cost uh, green hydrogen is a little bit costlier right now compared to gray hydrogen or blue hydrogen but but hopefully the cost of the hydrogen will come down with time so this is a project we are working uh, for for power pani for the refinery we are, will produce uh, 7 kta plan actually target is 25 26 so we will we'll set up a renewable hydrogen production plant at pani for the refinery and that hydrogen will be used uh, for our refinery application 
So this is a uh, this is with respect to the obligation which is coming with uh, by the government to use green hydrogen in the refinery. Then we are working on uh, many joint ventures like uh, uh, we are working with LNT and Renew Power to set up green hydrogen plant uh, in the country. And we are also working with LNT, a joint venture, uh, to, to manufacture the electrolyzer technology. So, so that the uh, production electrolyzer technology got mature in the country. So let's talk about the hydrogen use in mobility sector, actually. Why? So hydrogen can be, hydrogen, first is the pure hydrogen you can use. Then you can use blended, hydrogen blended CNG, actually, which is an intermediate technology. So we have demonstrated that plan. I'll explain that project. Then hydrogen can be directly used in an IC engine. But there are some challenges, like there might be NOx emission for that. But this technology can be implemented because the technology cost of IC engine is very low compared to fuel cell. In fuel cell, hydrogen you can use efficiently, but, but the cost of the technology is a little bit higher. So let's talk about hydrogen CNG. So Indian Oil's quest to use hydrogen as a fuel for the mobility sector for achieving emission reduction, HCNG is the, HCNG is the first intermediate step actually. So what we have done uh, uh, by the order of Honor Honorable Supreme Court, we have set up a four TPD hydrogen HCNG production plant at Rajgat and the buses, 50 buses were running at Rajgat actually. So let's talk, wh what is hydrogen CNG? Hydrogen CNG is hydrogen blended CNG. So in conventional process, you can, you can, you can, you can produce hydrogen, then compress it, then you can mix in natural gas and you can produce HCNG. But this blending process require you need to manage two infrastructure, hydrogen infrastructure and natural gas infrastructure. Indian oil has developed a technology actually where you can do the partial reforming of the CNG and you can directly from the reactor you can get hydrogen blended CNG. And the composition of this hydrogen blended CNG is 18 volume percent hydrogen in, in the mixture actually. So directly you can uh, produce HCNG. So we set up a plant at Rajgarh DTC depot and that plant uh, was running for six months and, and 50 buses, CNG buses, BS4, BS4 buses were running with this fuel. And we got like 70% reduction in carbon monoxide, 25% hydrocarbon emission reduction. And the efficiency of the engine is higher. We are ge getting about 6% higher uh, economy, fuel economy. So that report, uh, it was successful actually. And then the report was submitted to uh, Honorable Supreme Court and the Ministry of Petroleum Natural Gas. We are waiting for that direction and uh, to, to use this uh, technology for, for an intermediate step for, on a hydrogen economy. So this is the plan and the minister was uh, inaugurating this plant actually at that moment in October 2020. This is on the demonstration of hydrogen in, in at Delhi. So this is implementation of environmentally benign fuel for uh, city buses in Delhi. So this is the first demonstration project Indian oil has done uh, in public places. These are the some initiatives we have created in Indian oil, uh, oil R&D at the beginning. We are, we are producing hydrogen using, using electrolyzer, PEM electrolyzer, then we are storing, uh, compressing it, storing at 550 bar and dispensing to the vehicle. And two buses were running, fuel cell buses, which is OHO is jointly developed by Tata Motors at our center, actually. And the, the buses are inaugurated by, uh, by, by uh, Principal science, uh, scientific advisor of government of India, of Prime Minister, Mr. P, Dr. P. Chidambaram, that moment. This is some of the activities we are working on fuel cell actually. We have 10 kilowatt uh, stack station where we can, we can evaluate the PEM fuel cell actually. So I know we do have done a lot, uh, lot of experiments on durability and life of the fuel cell at Indian conditions actually. And then we have developed the fuel cell forklift, uh, country's first uh, fuel cell forklift, which is running actually. 
then uh, we have also uh, developed a cycle actually which was uh, uh, which was running on hydrogen fuel cell so these are the some initiatives demonstration initiatives on fuel cell part and we really work on the power of possibilities of the fuel cell different different technologies so this is one of the first make in india initiative for hydrogen fuel cell projects so here we will test the full value chain of hydrogen hydrogen production storage then its application in the fuel cell this project is partially funded by government of in india actually we are getting 100 crore nearly for from csp so what we will do in this project actually so we will we will produce hydrogen from using three different technologies one is solar pv power electrolyzer then biomass oxygasification then bio cng reforming in the first process, that is solar PV power electrolyzer, we are going to set up three types of technology, all the technology, alkaline, PEM, and SOAC technology. So we will evaluate all the technology with respect to how it performs with respect to solar PV. And that hydrogen will be stored and compressed and bus will run on this hydrogen. Second is the second technology we are working is biomass oxygen We are working with the academic institute where uh, biomass will be gasified to produce 99.99% uh, purity hydrogen. And we are getting about 100 gram of hydrogen per kg of biomass in this technology. So this, this, this plant will be put up uh, in our campus in the next year actually. Then bio CNG reforming, we, we have the bio CNG production process actually in annual R&D has. So what we will do is that we will reform that bio because reforming technology is mature will produce hydrogen on that process. So we are waiting on three technologies and we'll come out with a report that which technology is economical and suitable for, for India actually. So, and, and now we'll, we'll, we'll also discuss the engineering issue during the scale up of these all the technologies actually. Uh, Dr. Kappan, uh, just can you expedite? Uh... Oh, sure, sure. So this is the first, then second uh, is the we have blue hydrogen, I was talking at the beginning that blue hydrogen we have at the refinery. So that hydrogen uh, will be uh, will reverse that hydrogen and the buses will run uh, from, from our refinery to the Statue of Unity. Unity. So this will enable the blue hydrogen market in the country. This is one demonstration project we are doing at, uh, at our refinery actually. So this is another project we are because storage is also important. We have developed indigenously developed type three cylinder which will be used for storage of hydrogen. So this is fast making India in, in initiative. So in conclusion, I I want to say that wine crisis of energy and environment are 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 make are mobilizing the hydrogen research in the country. And I will say that till renewable hydrogen or green hydrogen is not available in the country blue hydrogen can be sourced actually for making the uh, for making uh, hydrogen economy possible in the country we are working on many technologies on electrolyzer storage and its application i hope all these technologies will come in fusion by the time actual demand start growing up the future is greener than uh, than uh, we imagine actually so this is our last slide actually. So the challenge is the, like it's a sole analogy. Challenge was the government. So the biggest challenge is the environment. And, and Thakur in the former government is trying to solve this. And we have two protagonists, green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. And the, the facilitator are the uh, renewable energy, natural gas. And we need a agile, uh, transportation mechanism actually so they will assist and and we can also use uh, other hydrogen production pathways uh, like uh, like supporting actors so 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 that we will, will be able to reach the uh, net zero and uh, thank you thank you sir. if you have any question i will be happy to answer thank you thank you dr tapan actually i uh, will be having the questions session at the end uh, I request to, con to please continue with us till the end of the session. Uh, thank you again, sir. And that was Dr. Tapan. Uh, he was uh, DGM with Indian Oil R&D. And uh, thank you for sharing your valuable ideas and your lecture. Uh, I, now I request uh, Dr. Arnav Dutta from 
आई आई टी मुंबई ही इज एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एट आई आई टी मुंबई एंड इज एसोसिएटेड विथ इज एसोसिएट विथ इंटर डिसिप्लिनरी प्रोग्राम इन क्लाइमेट चेंज डॉक्टर दत्त इज ऑल्सो एसोसिएट ऑफ इंडियन अकाडमी ऑफ साइंस एंड ही वॉज ए रामानुजन फेलो ही इज ऑल्सो इन टू अल्टरनेट एनर्जी रिसर्च सो नाउ आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर अर्नब टू काइंडली टेक फॉरवर्ड so thank you all so i hope my slides are visible yes sir and uh, thank you so first of all i would like to thank mr manoj for this excellent uh, opportunity where we are actually discussing about the green hydrogen with the required players and also i would like to thank mr tapan beda for setting up the stage where he actually discussed about the green hydrogen technology and very heartening to see that from indigenous way in indian industry we are actually coming up with newer ideas on green hydrogen so in my talk i will go a little bit on the back and give you a little bit of the academic background why we need to uh, cover this hydrogen avenue and what are the different technologies can be upcoming and some of them are already being implemented around the world some of them are actually at this moment in a lower tier level in the lab but is going to come around very soon so first of all uh, this is already covered by mr tapan beda but i just to browse through that why we care about green hydrogen so before green hydrogen we are mostly worried about energy and as a growing country like india we actually need a huge amount of energy every year and most of our energy is actually coming from the fossil fuels at this moment right now we are actually covering almost 70% of our energy from the fossil fuel which in unfortunately produce a huge amount of carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide come into the atmosphere and creating all these problems we are facing with respect to the climate change and now all the countries around the world especially india is leading the way where we actually meet and acknowledge yes this is a problem and over the last few climate change conferences which is happening starting from the paris then in 2021 it was in uh mm, it was in the uh, in uh, scotland and then uh, oh, sorry glasgow and then in 2022 last year it was in uh, egypt where we all agreed that it is a problem so we need to cut down so india has pledged that we will cut down our carbon dioxide emission by almost half by this decade and by 2070 we will try to be carbon neutral now this is much easier said than done like how we are going to have our energy uh, carbon dioxide cut down without compromising our growth without compromising our energy production and that is where it is the renewable energy resources come into the picture so we are already uh, looking into the other alternatives compared to the fossil fuels and we found solar energy is one of them which can actually provide us a good amount of energy we are also looking into the wind energy the tidal energy the geothermal energy all this energy are looking for so now all these energies are very good because they don't have any carbon footprint but the issue is they are very intermittent in nature what do i mean by intermittent that means that they are not really reliable source of continuous flow of energy for an example if i take 1 kg of our petrol or 1 liter of petrol i know exactly how much energy i can get it from there but if i say like how much energy i can get from 1 hour of solar light it is variable because it depends on like whether it is a sunny day or cloudy day it is in the early in the morning in the middle of the day or later in the day similarly from the wind energy it depends on like how much wind is flowing what is the flow of the wind so different factors are actually cutting down the overall energy production from this renewables so that is why although they are very nice resources of energy but it cannot really produce a continuous flow of energy as the fossil fuels does so we try to so i would request you to please uh, turn down your volumes if it is possible yeah thank you so what we are actually looking into can we use this renewables as the same way as the fossil fuels that means we are going to use this renewables but can we get a continuous flow of energy for that what we need to do is to convert this energy into chemical forms because fossil fuel is a basically a chemical energy so if we can convert that to a chemical energy then we know exactly how much energy we have stored and how much energy we will extract if we actually continue to use this pathway and that is where it comes 
hydrogen in the picture. Because when we talk about how to store renewables to the chemical form, it has been already shown by the biology. Biology is doing photosynthesis, which actually produces a huge amount of carbohydrate. And this is actually produced from carbon dioxide. So this carbon dioxide to carbohydrate conversion, from there, we are actually storing the solar energy. And later on, when we are actually eating and doing the respiration, we are getting out that energy. Our goal, we are going to replicate this process, but not with carbon dioxide to carbohydrate because that is much trickier to handle. What we are going to do is water to hydrogen. And by this water to hydrogen conversion, we are going to store the energy of the renewables. And once we have hydrogen energy, we know exactly how much energy I have stored and how much energy I can extract. And later on, we are going to uh, get the energy out of the hydrogen and produce water again. And when I'm talking about water, it is actually the proton source that we are using. And we are talking about water because water is the most abundant resource of proton we can think about all around the world. It is abundant all around the place. And if we can crack the code, how we can produce hydrogen from the proton, that will solve our issue. So that is where the premise of the hydrogen was set up and how we can use hydrogen as an energy resource. Now, when you talk about hydrogen and very nicely again put up by um, Dr. Bera, like hydrogen is not something new into our life. We have been using hydrogen for a long time and in chemical industry, hydrogen is a known force because we are using hydrogen for different purposes. And he has very nicely shown that we are using hydrogen for chemical and metal purification, especially for the production of ammonia from ammonia to urea. So our food security is connected with hydrogen. And then we are actually producing different kind of fuels, different kind of chemicals, methanol, and different kind of petrochemicals that is also using hydrogen. Right now, we have also started using hydrogen for transportation in Europe and US has been already in the large scale. In India, we have also started with the leadership of IOCL. And we have also started using hydrogen for heat and power distribution through the buildings. So that is means that hydrogen has already found its space in the chemical industry. Now, the issue is that how we are talking about hydrogen production without a carbon footprint. In that particular scale, when you are talking about the full value chain of hydrogen, and if you look into the world map, it is the map around 2021, India is not having a very strong presence in this map. Only one dot, and that is thanks to IOCL, we have. But if you look into China and Europe and US, they are becoming the early movers. However, now India has awakened and they are taking very much fast steps to cover up that area. And for that, India have developed the green hydrogen map and we have developing policies that how we can produce hydrogen, how we can utilize it different places, how the different companies, the different entities can get support from the academia, support from the government and possibly move towards this particular hydrogen based direction faster. And this particular policy document uh, discussion will be coming just next to my talk. And over there, this is again covered, like how we are getting this hydrogen. We are in India at this moment, we are producing almost five to six uh, million tons of hydrogen. And most of them is actually coming from coal or natural gas. So from the coal, we actually do a reformation process called coal gasification, where we produce hydrogen. And from the methane, we call a dear experiment called steam methane reformation, where we actually react methane with steam at very high temperature and produce hydrogen. But in both these processes, we produce a huge amount of stoichiometric amount of carbon dioxide. And that is why while we are producing million tons of hydrogen, we are also producing multi-million tons of carbon dioxide. And that is actually defining our purpose, why we're moving to the hydrogen, because our main goal was to remove this carbon footprint. But the current processes are still producing a huge amount of carbon dioxide. And that is why it is called the gray or brown hydrogen, because it has a huge amount of carbon footprint. So the question is why we're still doing it, because it is the most cheapest process at this moment. We can get hydrogen at a rate of 120 to 150 rupees per kilo of hydrogen by these processes. Now, how we can make it better? One process, let's continue with this coal gasification and steam methane reformation. But what we are going to do, we are going to capture this carbon dioxide and stop it from going to the atmosphere. And for that, we need carbon dioxide capture and utilization procedures, which is known as a CCUS. However, these processes are expensive, so it actually adds up to the 
hydrogen production cost. And right now, if we include this CCUS process, which is known as the blue hydrogen process, the cost actually goes up, although we are cutting down the carbon footprint. And the final one that is actually all our goal is that can we produce hydrogen without any carbon footprint? And from there, we call this process as green hydrogen. And where we are going to produce electrolysis and the energy required for electrolyzing the water to produce hydrogen and oxygen as a very important side product, it is getting derived from the renewable resources. So this is going to have the least amount of carbon footprint, but the current technologies is actually making it very expensive. Right now it uh, hovers around 400 to 500 rupees per kilo of hydrogen, which is three to four, five times higher than the coal gasification or steam methane reformation. So that is the current scenario we have, and now we look how we can make it better. So this is actually a pictorial diagram of how the electrolysis is actually happening. So what actually happens over here, first the water comes into this electrolyzer system, which actually consists of two different electrodes. One is called the cathode, one is called the anode. Anode is the positively charged electrode. And over there, the water comes, and in this positively charged system, the water actually splitted. You can see this water molecule coming, and it is actually splitted. It's splitted into oxygen, these two blue circles producing oxygen over there. And when the water produces oxygen, it leaves electron, which is this green small balls traveling through, and this hydrogen, uh, sorry, the protons as this red balls. So this electron actually converts to this other part of the electrode, which is the negatively charged cathode, and where the electron and this proton, which is actually produced in the first step, combines and produce hydrogen gas. And that is getting stored over here. And this full process, you need energy to split water to ensure the electron comes to the other end and binds with the proton and produce hydrogen. And this whole energy, we are actually supposed to take from the renewables like solar fuel, so we are using a solar panel to provide that energy. So this is the full process. In anode side, we are doing the water splitting, producing oxygen and proton and electron. This proton and electron gets combined on the other side and producing the hydrogen. Now, what are the different ways we can actually establish this process? The one is how we can develop this whole system that you're talking about in a small, compact system. And that is known as the electrolyzer. So this is the electrolyzer what we need. As we already discussed, we need two electrodes, one is anode, one is cathode, and between to ensure that the protons are actually going from the anode to the cathode side, we over here put something called a membrane. And this membrane allows only the protons to go to the other side to ensure a fast movement of the proton. And this full system, uh, these electrodes, this membrane, we call them the membrane electrode assembly or MEA, and that creates one of the stack which is actually going to work. And in the real system, because we need a huge amount of hydrogen, what we do, we actually put a series of such stacks. So this is how we actually put, this is a one cell, there's a second cell, there's a third cell. We put it one after another and create the actual electrolyzer system. So you can see all these multiple stacks. So each of this black array is actually representing one of the cellular stack. And we typically create 30 to 50 stacks to create this overall system. And later on, this is in real life how it is supposed to look like when you're talking about multi tons of hydrogen production. So this is the real stack which looks like the chemistry remains the same, only the size differs and some of the engineering. And over here, this is the full stack, probably close to 200 to 500 stacks over there, and it produces a huge amount of hydrogen which is coming from the water. And over there, I would like to also mention that what kind of water we can use. We can use acidic water or we can use alkaline water. Because as we know, water itself in neutral condition, the same water we drink, it doesn't really split out very well because this proton and water and the electron needs to actually go through the water and that needs conductivity. And without a huge amount of salt or ions present in the solution, that is not going to be conductive. So either you make it a very acidic or very alkaline solution to ensure a very conductive system to produce hydrogen. And this is uh, how the different systems are coming out. So in Indian system, Mr. Beda has already actually give us, given us a very nice overview of what we are actually doing. This is, I'm going to the other global players who are actually working. Saudi Arabia, one of the Middle Eastern countries who are also looking into the hydrogen as a main resource. 
And over there, they're using wind and solar power and connecting that power to the stack of electrolyzers, which are producing a huge amount of hydrogen all around the place. And this hydrogen is actually getting connected for the ammonia production, where the nitrogen is coming from an air separation unit. And this ammonia is actually now storing the hydrogen because hydrogen storage always comes to a problem because it is very light. If you want to st uh, store it in a liquid form, you have to go to very low temperature to minus 253 degrees centigrade or 20 Kelvin temperature, which actually maintaining that temperature is very tricky, especially a hot country like India. So that is why we convert that to ammonia. This process is already well established all around the uh, industry. And this ammonia can later be dissociated to produce hydrogen on demand and use it for different purposes. And this is the other part, which is actually coming in some part of the Scandinavian countries where energy from the geothermal energy is actually used to actually use water to produce steam and from the steam we actually run the turbine to create electricity and that electricity is used for the production of hydrogen and oxygen fire electricity so we are using water over here and this water is actually transferring the energy from the heat energy that is converting to the electricity via the turbines and use that over there so this is the another way of hydrogen production in a very large scale and this is some of the research we are doing in our lab so over there, as we discussed, that we need two different electrodes. One is the anode, one is the cathode. One side, the water is getting splitted to produce oxygen. One side is protons are reacting to produce hydrogen. Typically, we need two different catalysts. One side, the hydrogen production catalysis is done by platinum or palladium-based catalyst, which is very expensive. And also on the other side, the oxygen production happens with iridium or ruthenium-based catalyst, also very expensive. So in our lab, we decided like how we can cut that cost. So very nicely, again, uh, Mr. Beda has pointed out that we need very distilled water because these catalysts are very sensitive, so it cannot survive very harsh conditions. So we actually decided we are going to prepare very robust catalysts which can survive much more rough conditions. So we don't need to use distilled water all the time. We can use seawater or industrial wastewater. Secondly, we try to use such catalysts where the same catalyst can do hydrogen production and water oxidation. So oxygen production, this anode side, and hydrogen production, this cathode side, will be the same material. And that is what we have developed so far. The same material is doing the catalysis, and we actually uh, patented this catalyst, and we put that on a steel electrode. And over there, you can see one side hydrogen is coming out, one side is oxygen is coming out, and it has been producing water to uh, hydrogen and oxygen from water over 24 hours. And not only that, if you using the same catalyst for both sides of the reaction, what happens if I take the positive and the negative and cross polarize it, it does the same reaction. So previously, which was doing oxygen, now it start converting hydrogen, and which was, was doing hydrogen earlier, it start converting to oxygen. So much easier to assemble in large scale and easier to handle when you're talking about large scale hydrogen production. So with that, this is my last slide, where I'm going to talk about this green hydrogen production is coming out very well, but we can, actually uh, include it with the carbon dioxide management also. Because in the other side, we know how to capture carbon dioxide, which is actually well established. We have developed some new technology and some established technologies are there by where the carbon dioxide, which has been captured, can be converted to carbon monoxide by reverse water gas shift reaction. And once you have carbon monoxide in industry, carbon monoxide is a very useful material. And this carbon monoxide, we can convert it with to methane or any hydrocarbon by a Fischer-Tropsch process, where we are combining that with green hydrogen that we are to talk about. And then we can continue even with our existing hydrocarbon-based energy technology and use it wherever we are going to produce carbon dioxide that we're going to capture and convert it to carbon monoxide and convert it to hydrocarbon back again in a cyclic manner because we are going to use green hydrogen on the other hand. So all together, you can see it is going to use for us, we are going to use the same LPG to cook, but we don't know that this LPG is coming, is from the carbon dioxide from the air and connected with the green hydrogen. So by that, we can actually use green hydrogen in much more broader way, not only on the hydrogen-based technology, but also connected with our existing carbon-based technology and make it a totally carbon neutral system. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk over here and I'll be happy to take any further questions at the end of the session.
So thank you, uh, Mr. Manoj. So now the stage is yours. Thank you. So you are uh, mute, Mr. Manoj. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adam. Uh, uh, thanks for explaining this technology in a very simplified session for all the uh, participants here. I would request you to kindly continue till end of the session for uh, taking the question and answer session. Uh, now I will request uh, Dr. Kishore Kumar from, uh, from CST to take his session. Uh, he is the additional director at CST. Uh, Dr. Kishore, uh, please uh, continue the session. So, are you able to see my screen? Uh, your screen is visible, uh, but slides, I don't think it is open. I hope uh, now it is uh, visible to you all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's uh, now it's on the screen. Yeah. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kishore Kumar Bhimwal from uh, CST. Uh, I would like to thank PCRA for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak in front of you all, and uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, so during this presentation, I will try to cover the national policy perspectives, uh, hydrogen transportation and uh, storage challenges. Dr. Kishore, I think you can put the slide in the slide more so that it will be easier for uh, us to view it. It is an... Uh... Now it's okay? Yeah. yeah. So India is uh, one of the fastest, fastest growing economy and will need more energy to cater its demand amidst climate commitments. Uh, India energy future has four pillars. Uh, energy access, number one. Number two is energy efficiency. Number three, energy sustainability. Number four, energy security. So although India's per capita CO2 emission are almost half of as compared to the world uh, average, which is a uh, 6.2 ton, uh, India made the following commitments at COP26 uh, summit as a responsible uh, nation. Uh, number one is 50% uh, of its energy requirements uh, from renewable energy by 2030. Number two, reduction of the carbon intensity by 45% uh, by 2030 uh, over to 2005 levels. And an, another is a net, net zero or becoming carbon neutral by uh, 2070. So moving to uh, our next slide. Addressing the nation uh, on 75th Independence Day, our uh, Honorable Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi announced the National Hydrogen Mission and subsequently uh, on 4th of January this year, uh, the Union Cabinet has approved the National Hydrogen Mission. Uh, the initial outlay for the mission will be uh, roughly uh, 19,744 crore. <clears throat> So, uh, green hydrogen is quite familiar nowadays and a lot of awareness. Your slide is, sorry, uh, your slide is not moving. I don't know about the other participants. Can you confirm? Yes, yes, yes it's not moving. Same, yes, now it's okay. Now yeah. it's okay? Now it is. It's it's like, now it's okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
so green hydrogen is quite familiar nowadays uh, and lot of awareness is being spread across the world for various hydrogen technologies so i feel that it is imperative to make the audience understand about the uh, government policies which is also very important to start with the mission objective uh, objective of the mission is to make india the global hub for production uses and export of green hydrogen and its derivatives the mission also aims to make india a leader in technology and manufacturing of electrolyzer and other enabling uh, technologies for green hydrogen sourcing uh, green hydrogen it is estimated that currently around 6.7 million metric ton of hydrogen is consumed annually in india for various purposes like uh, petroleum refining uh, manufacturing of ammonia for fertilizer methanol pro production treatment of uh, treatment and production of metals etc currently the global commercial electrolyzer manufacturing uh, capacity is estimated to be uh, only about 2 to 4 gigawatt per annum in last 3 years various national governments and industrial organizations have announced deployment goals of a total over 200 giga gigawatt electrolyzer capacities by 2030 so to ensure low cost of delivery and uh, renewable energy for electrolyzer based uh, project the mission proposes various policy provisions for trans uh, transmission uh, connectivity banking open access and the energy storage next uh, phase approach so mission is proposed to be implemented in phase manner uh, basically in phase 1 uh, focusing on deployment of green hydrogen in the sectors that are already using hydrogens uh, like like refineries fertilizers and the city gas sectors which will also create a sustainable demand to support new investments in uh, green hydrogen production the main focus of phase 1 will be on creating demand while enabling adequate supply by increasing the domestic electrolyzer manufacturing capacity uh in the second phase uh, mission will build on these foundations activities and undertake green hydrogen initiatives in new sectors of the economy uh by the beginning of the second phase uh, green hydrogen cost uh, cost Uh, is expected to be become uh, competitive with fossil fuels based alternatives uh, which will allow for accelerating growth of the production this second phase activities would enhance penetration across all potentials potential sectors uh, to drive deep decarbonization of the economy mission is an in, uh, integrated mission uh, strategy according to the mission guidelines all concerned ministries departments agencies and institutions of the central as well as government state government will work together for focus and coordinated steps to ensure successful achievement of the mission uh moving to the next mission components uh, so you can see the right right side uh, mission component is divided into demand creation incentivized supply and key enabler so demand creation uh, creations for export market considering the renewable energy potential and the enabling framework proposed under the mission india's green hydrogen production cost are expected to be among the lowest in the world expected global demand is uh, today roughly 100 uh, mmt of green hydrogen and its deriv derivatives like green ammonia is expected uh, to emerge by 2030 so india is aiming at the about 10% of the global market india can potentially export about 10 uh, million metric ton of green hydrogen per annum so uh, moving to the domestic markets currently about 6.7 metric million ton hydrogen is uh, consumed annually in india and about 99% of this uh, quantity is utilized by the refineries and the fertilizers plant in both sectors a gray hydrogen can be substituted with green hydrogen reducing carbon footprint and dependence on imported fuel uh, fossil fuels uh, 
uh, another component important component is uh, competitive bidding for procurement so for this mnre will frame model guidelines excuse me sorry yes. to interrupt the slides are again not moving no no it's uh, same the slide slide it you can see the mission okay. component yeah so here it's worth mentioning that the uh, European Union is also advanced stage of uh, finalizing the green hydrogen certification program to import green hydrogen from the emerging green hydrogen markets like India. So they are ready with the uh, their certification programs. Uh, next uh, is a uh, site program, strategic intervention for green hydrogen transition. In this program, uh, financial incentives and non-financial measures are proposed under the site program, which is to increase production of low-cost uh, green hydrogen and domestic manufacturing of related equipment and technologies. At the initial stage, two distinct financial incentives mechanisms targeted to support the domestic manufacturing of electrolyzer and production of the green hydrogen are proposed. It is expected that the proposed incentives and interventions under the site program will significantly reduce the cost of green hydrogen. So key enablers are like resources to facilitate delivery of renewable power. Various supportive policies provisions will be extended to green hydrogen pro projects. This will include a uh, waiver of interstate trans uh, transmission charges for renewable energy uses for green hydrogen production. Next is uh, facilitating renewable energy banking and the time bound grant of open access and the connectivity. Talking about the R&D, R&D support is uh, proposed to identify mission mode projects with short term, medium term and the blue sky projects. For short term term uh, horizon, the uh, mission focus will be on uh, end product deployment to aggregate and leverage existing capabilities and uh, infrastructure during the phase. So likely projects will include, uh, number one is deployment of the domestic modular electrolyzer. Uh, next is a type three and type four uh, compressed hydrogen tank, PAM-based fuel cells, and the biomass based hydrogen generation with intent to increase operational efficiency. Mid and blue sky projects will aim to develop capabilities of third generation electrolyzers, electrocatalysts basically, and SOECs, SOFCs, seawater electrolysis, thermocatalytic uh, pyrolysis, plasma pyrolysis, salt cavern surveys high entropy alloys for the renewable hydrogen storage. Ease of doing business, existing uh, statutory approvals are uh, and permissions processes will be streamlined and the mission and new processes will be established. Efforts will be made for the simplified process and fast approvals, leveraging technologies for creating ease of doing business environment infrastructure and supply the mission will accordingly identify and develop regions capable capable of supporting large scale production and utilization of hydrogen at, as green hydrogen hubs uh, in initial phase it is planned to set up uh, at least two such green hydrogen hubs in the initial phase in an integrated manner to allow pooling of resources and uh, achievement of the scale talking about the regulations codes and standards for the success of the mis uh, mission regulatory guidelines safety codes and relevant quality and performance standards will play an important role significant efforts are already underway for building a standard and regulatory fr framework for enabling the green hydrogen ecosystem so in this uh, I must say that so social acceptance and public confidence in new technology and the green hydrogen ecosystem is very important. Therefore, safety will be prioritized 
across the value chain and addressed as a part of standard and testing protocol. I would like to mention that here uh, that CST is currently involved in two such hydrogen standard formation process. For number one is ISO Technic uh, TC193 CZ1, for which EDCST Shri Alok Sharma ji is a convener, which is basically determine the percentage of hydrogen blend in the existing network, natural gas network. And second is for the OISD, OISD uh, hydrogen safety standard, uh, where Dr. SS Gupta is the convener. CST is also making a hydrogen test loop for testing various percentage of hydrogen blends in the existing natural gas network, along with various CSUs like IOC, BPCL, XPCL, GAL, and EIL. Uh, talking to the next uh, uh, topic, which is uh, skill development last. Skill development program will focus on reskilling the workforce, workforce in polluting sunset sectors to be absorbed into the green hydrogen and its auxiliary ecosystem. Basically, uh, this will enable greater productivity capacities of human capital and enable just uh, the transition. That's risk management. Mission seeks to minimize various risks through an appropriate mix of financial and non-financial levers and review mechanisms uh, this will be monitored regularly by the mission secreted through regular uh, con uh, consultations with the, uh, with the stakeholders. Uh, final is uh, the financial outlay and the uh, expected outcome. So the initial outlay, as I have already mentioned, of the mission is uh, 19,744 crore. Out of this, uh, 400 will be you know allotted for the R&D uh, purposes. India's green hydrogen production capacity is likely to reach uh, at least 5 MMT per annum with an associate renewable energy capacity addition about um, 125 gigawatts. So moving to the, this is, so talking for the our next topic, which is uh, transportation option and uh, challenges. One of the main barriers uh, to moving towards hydrogen economy is the difficulty of developing a reliable and cost-effective trans hydrogen transportation and delivery system. Nowadays, for medium quantity and distum, uh, distance uh, compressed gas truck and liquid transportation truck are the only option. However, for bulk transportation, bulk hydrogen transportation pipeline is cost-effective option. Uh, but laying a dedicated hydrogen pipeline is not only prohibitively expensive, but also a time-consuming process. A pipeline may require uh, more than four years to become operational. That is from concept to commissioning. One of the options to solve this problem is to transport hydrogen through the existing natural gas pipeline. Uh, here are some of the key uh, challenges related to, uh, to the green hydrogen transportation. Uh, number one is the high capital cost of hydrogen. Currently, hydrogen cost of uh, you know production of green hydrogen is very high uh, as compared to the as comparative to the uh, fossil fuel based alternatives. This makes green hydrogen less competitive in the transportation uh, sector which uh, where cost is the uh, key consideration infrastructure uh, there is a lack of infrastructure available for the production for the storage and the transportation of green hydrogen building an ex extensive network of hydrogen refueling stations for example would require significant investment and coordination next is a uh, hydrogen imprisonment so this is a technical uh, term. Basically, hydrogen atoms uh, penetrates the steel matrix, both the lattice and the grain boundaries. Due to the presence of hydrogen atoms inside the steel, the mechanical properties like uh, ductility and the fracture toughness uh, will reduce. And the stress intensity factor and the fatigue crack uh, growth rate will increase. So it is observed that due to the high presence of the hydrogen in blend, and at high operating pressure, the severity of failure of the 
pipeline increases safety hydrogen as you all are aware that hydrogen is highly flammable gas which can pose safety risk if not handled properly this means that there are additional safety consideration are and regulations that must be followed when using green hydrogen in transportation sector supply chain issues the supply chain for green hydrogen is not yet well established which means that there are uncertainties around the availability and reliability of the fuel codes and standards as i already mentioned uh, currently uh, non availability of codes and standard is also a cause of concern for trans uh, transporting hydrogen uh, to the desired location the regulatory approvals as hydrogen economy is in its early stage in india and hydrogen safety is concerned therefore stringent regulatory approvals makes it makes transport uh, transportation basically challenging so there are ongoing researches and development into the new technologies and materials that could help to address the some of the uh, challenges related to related to the green hydrogen transportation so talking uh, to our next and uh, i think last slide second last slide uh, about hydrogen storage option most appropriate storage medium depends uh, on volume to be stored duration of the storage required speed of discharge and the geographic av availability of the different options today hydrogen is most commonly stored as a compressed gas or liquid in tank for small scale mobile and stationary uh, applications green hydrogen storage faces several challenges uh, that needs uh, needs to be addressed to enable its wide spread uh, adoption uh, number 1 is cost again one of the main challenges in storing green hydrogen is the cost of storage storing hydrogen requires specialized equipment and materials which can be expensive especially for large scale storage systems lower uh, energy densities hydrogen as you all are aware has a very low energy density by volume but high energy density by pannier mass so lower energy density by volume which means that the large volume of storage are needed to store the same amount of energy as fossil fuels required this can make hydrogen storage challenging especially for the transportation application where space is a constraint scalability is issue currently there are no commercial available storage solutions that can efficiently store large amount of hydrogen for longer period this means that uh, scaling up hydrogen storage for uh, use in power grids transportation and and, uh, and other industrial application can be challenging boil off losses uh boil off losses occurs when gaseous hydrogen has to be released from the from a cryogenic tank due to a, due to a liquid hydrogen evaporation uh there are substantial drawbacks for all areas in which hydrogen liquid hydrogen is discussed as a potential fuel to limit the climate change uh, the uh, venting losses from the trailer potentially represents a very important source of boil off losses so what are the solutions uh, to reduce this cost of uh, hydrogen storage new storage technologies are being developed for example solid state hydrogen storage materials such as metal hydrides chemical hydrides which can offer higher storage densities and lower lower cost than the traditional storage method overall the development and the deployment of these solutions and technologies are critical to overcome the challenges associated with green hydrogen storages but these solutions or uh, like uh, metal hydrides are also having their uh, disadvantages like lower density uh, lower uh, storage capacity durability of materials 
like um, the maximum uh, cycles are 1500 and the regeneration issues so by addressing these challenges it will be possible to make green hydrogen a more viable and sustainable energy solution for a wide range of application so in conclusion concluding uh, with this we can conclude that the national green hydrogen mission is a step in india in india's energy transition particularly in decarbonization of hard to abate sectors and to make india a energy independent by 2047 which is a mission which is a vision for our uh, prime minister shri narendra modi with this uh, thank you thank you very much thank you mr kishor uh, for your insight into the poly journal, green policy as well as the transportation and the storage challenges that uh, hydrogen fuel is going to face and how to overcome it thank you very much now i would request the house to uh, go for question answer session any questions please can be uh, uh, can you just start the question answer? Yeah. Yeah, I am Eskasina calling uh, from PCR Eastern Region. Hello. Yes, uh, I have a question to all the three presenters. Uh, first, I will start with the constraints what they have discussed. Like, uh, uh, as per them, renewable energy, that is green energy route, that is uh, solar and uh, wind route, the best. Okay, let me answer uh, first. Actually, uh, that's a uh, pertinent question, sir. Uh, I think people are trying to produce green hydrogen using all options, and we don't know which option will be economical. As 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 if, uh, as Kishorji has said, green hydrogen is not cheaper. So for green hydrogen, first is the electrolysis route, and where you use renewable power like solar power or wind power. That is one route, but you know, uh, for solar power, you need a huge amount of land and solar power produce one places and, and then the grid stability, then hydrogen production will be at some other places. Those are the uh, challenges we need to work. So this, this is one aspect. Second aspect is the biomass gasification. Uh, uh, that is also a, we consider green hydrogen because you are using biomass. And third is the biomass uh, reforming process, uh, sorry, bio CNG reforming process. All the process actually we are will demonstrate all the technology and we'll come out with a report that which technology is cheaper, which technology will produce hydrogen at lower cost. And then secondly, uh, whether this hydro uh, at cheaper cost whether, and we'll for what technology has the challenges of scale up actually. That's it, that is also an issue. But more or less, people agreed that if hydrogen is produced in a distributed manner, then transportation cost will be less. So that that model is, um, uh, you can be used to produce green hydrogen. It's difficult at this stage, uh, which is best because all technologies have their challenges. Solar energy has the intermittency effect challenges. Then wind energy has its own challenges. So all have challenges, and we need to work. On, on all the technologies to produce green hydrogen. That is my summation. So I think adding to uh, reply to this, uh, you know, question, I think both the technologies, uh, solar as well as uh, wind, both are having their uh, pros and cons. Uh, main uh, issue with the solar is the intermittency, means like it is not available 24 by 7. So otherwise, uh, both the technologies are, you know, uh, Good and 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 uh, India is you know very much uh, uh, ahead in uh, re renewables like uh, solar and uh, wind wind power. So both are having their uh, pros and cons. You cannot de decide that which is uh, good and which is better. The utilization sector of the you know uh, wind is little bit higher than the solar. That's it. So thank you, Dr. Beda and Mr. Bimbal for your input. So I would also like to add over there, like we actually go with the concept of like uh, 
innovation comes out as we actually go for the different routes and we look for the different challenges. So when we have a challenge like that, we don't look at it as like a negative factor, but like an opportunity to come out with new innovation. And just you can imagine like 20 years, even 15 years back, when you're looking into solar power, all of us are very negatively poised to that, like how it can do that because it is having so much of uh, capex to play with. But now if we look into it, India is uh, converting 20% of its energy requirement from the solar energy. So as we go forward and look into the more details of it, we understand more of it. And then at the end, we actually need to produce green, green hydrogen from an energy resource which doesn't have a carbon footprint. We don't really care about whether it is coming from a solar, wind, or tidal, or any particular biomass energy. So that is why making the hydrogen uh, utilization in the industrial scale and if possible in the domestic scale, that will create the opportunity to for the demand of hydrogen. And then the rest of those things, we will uh, obviously going to come together from the industry and academia and make it a way for that. And the policies are going to play a huge role on that aspect as well. So for an example, if you look into solar energy, in the beginning, government gives a huge subsidy and that's why it has been pushed in a larger amount. And right now, the solar energy electricity is actually very much cost uh, uh, comparative with the <laughs> other energy resources. So that is why I believe that uh, it is not more of like a challenge. It is more of like an opportunity how we can look into the other directions also and make the existing system a little bit better. So that will be my take on that. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Devasis Thakur from Numalikar Refinery Limited. Uh, so my question to Dr. Arnab Dutta, uh, as uh, you have already said that you have done some experience with, with the PM electrolyzer, uh, with a different cathode and not uh, uh, without using the PZM electrodes like uh, platinum and iridium. But the point is that uh, uh, are you using the same uh, membrane like nephion or PFSA in this case? Yeah, so that is a very good question. So. Over there, we actually going uh, stepwise. So first step was that can I remove the uh, electrodes from the platinum and palladium and go to a source which is actually much more cheaper and abundant, especially in India. So once we achieve that, then we look into the overall cost. The cost is still a little bit on the higher side because of this membrane, because we are using napion based membranes from DuPont, yes. which is actually pretty costly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is why right now we are actually using a different polymer and mm -hmm. which is actually giving us a similar reactivity, but with much less costly. And right now, uh, the most recent one we are actually working, can we even use a membraneless electrode uh, system so that we can actually produce the hydrogen even without a membrane? So this is the current status of the research, not only in our lab, but in certain other labs in India. And if we are using without uh, membrane, in that case, uh, there will be a possibility of like, you know, pressurization in the oxygen or hydrogen chamber. Uh, if you use the uh, direct uh, precise chamber in the hydrogen side or the cathode mm -hmm. side. So mm -hmm. how we are going to restrict this movement of uh, yes. uh, like uh, gases uh, through this uh, if you're not using any membrane? In yes, the commercial so space, is, in, a, in a commercial yes. space. Yes, yes. So, so right now, most of our experience we're doing at TL level four, which is a prototype of the systems. And over there in the electrolyzer system, what happens? The hydrogen and oxygen is getting built up which needs to be removed. So over there, what we are actually working most closely is the channels on the electrode surface. So we are actually using particular design of the channel, which actually ensures a fast movement of the gases. And on the either side, where we're actually capturing the hydrogen and oxygen, we're keeping that a little bit on the lower pressure. So it is actually kind of like sucking the gases out of the electrodes, because at the end, we need to move the materials from the solution to the electrode surface. And that we can do by creating a membrane which actually ensures a fast movement of the material to the electrode side, or we can do that on the either side, we create a little bit of low pressure of the system where the hydrogen and oxygen is coming very fast, and that actually ensures the movement of the traffic in the electrode. So that is the goal we are actually working. I cannot say like we have uh, totally successful yet, but we are getting very interesting and uh, encouraging result where we are so close to develop a totally electrode less system and we can get a very similar amount of hydrogen production rate as the membrane bound system. 
Yeah, uh, I do have two small questions for you. Uh, first one is that uh, uh, basically for a PAM, uh, the temperature of the cell is very important because it is around 60 degrees centigrade operation. Yes. So, uh, but yes. we cannot increase the temperature because the uh, limitation in the membrane, like there is a low conductivity of the nephron or PFSA. Uh, so okay. are you using, uh, is like uh, doing any experiment to increase the temperature so that we can reduce the uh, power consumption in the stack? And my second question yes. is that uh, in terms of the reaction kinetics yes. for the PEM, it is very important to maintain the kinetics of the reaction to reduce the uh, ferradic and non-ferradic uh, losses uh, in the stack. And uh, if I if I am not wrong, the uh, reversible uh, voltage is around 1.228 uh, and uh, your thermonuclear voltage is 1.48. Uh, but my point is that when you are experimenting this case, uh, do you see any like uh, over potential in uh, uh, cathode and anodic side? Uh, because and, and because of that, uh, there is an increase in the uh, like harmonic voltage in the stack. Have you seen yes. it in this type of uh, issues? Yeah, so thank you for this question. I'll go to the temperature dependent question first. So yes, temperature plays a huge role over there. And the PM fuel cell, what is the most uh, widely acknowledged fuel cell? So they have a tendency to like break down a little bit on losing the efficiency beyond 70 degrees centigrade. And as you Rightly notified is because of the stability of the MEA facility, the membrane electrode assembly. And what we are actually doing over here, we are developing very much robust catalyst which can survive even a temperature up to 120 to 130 degrees centigrade that we have tested under high pressure of water vapor. And right now, most of our catalysts we are actually testing at 80 degrees centigrade. And as I said, we are using a another alternative of polymer which is much more stable compared to the uh, nephion. So that is why we are getting much better results. And as you rightly notified, so we are actually putting our system in the solar energy outside. So we are creating the uh, electricity from the solar energy to drive the reaction. And as it is sitting outside, it is already reaching 40, 50, 50 degrees centigrade. And during the reaction, due to the non ferradic uh, uh, events, the temperature actually goes to 80 degrees centigrade. And we never tried to lower down the cool the system because at high temperature our catalyst is actually working better exactly. because of the availability of high energy of activation yes. so that is actually improving our system by almost 30 to 40 percent and mm. second com uh, question comes to the reaction kinetics so uh, none of the catalysts even platinum can work on the equilibrium potential of both oxygen production and hydrogen production so the overall cell potential is always 1.23 volt where oxygen evolves at plus 1.23, hydrogen evolves at zero. Yes, yes. And even for hydrogen, the reaction start within 0.01 to 0 0.05 mm -hmm. yes, volt. Exactly. That yes, is 110 yes. millivolt. But the thing is that how much hydrogen and oxygen you're producing, if we want to mm -hmm. have quite One significant amount of hydrogen and oxygen to be produced, yes. you need to put a good amount of uh, energy. And right now, the best uh, combination we have for hydrogen production side, the platinum, and the oxygen production side, the iridium oxide system, that require in either side, if you add another 400 to 500 millivolts of extra potential. So altogether, right now, the cell potential is around 1.7 volt. We also achieved the similar reactivity around 1.65 volt. But if we want to produce hydrogen, not it is happening, but at a faster rate, because at the end, what is the uh, parameter that will be all interested? How much kilograms of hydrogen I'm producing from one electrolyzer with respect mm -hmm. to time. So that is why sometimes we need to run not only at 10 milliampere per centimeter square current, but even 100 milliampere per centimeter square current. And for that, right now we found that we need a cell potential of working around two volts potential so that we can run the system. And accordingly, so, we are using the, yeah. So your current yeah, so density is quite high, you are saying. You are saying current density is quite high. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Akur, I think yeah. any technical discussion you can follow share with me so that I can get uh, Dr. Arnav. Uh, it would be beneficial. Uh, okay, Munuzi. If I, if floor okay. promise, can I ask one question, Doctor Bera? Just one question. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. During this his presentation, he told about the biomass oxy gasification uh, is one of the root for the renewable hydrogen. Uh, although it's a it's a one kind of renewable because uh, you are using the biomass as a feedstock. But my question is that during this process, you will be producing some CO2, and uh, because you are using oxygen and steam as a uh, gasification uh, as in. So uh, how are you using this CO2 uh, to reduce the, any losses of greenhouse gas emission, to, to reduce so, the greenhouse gas emission? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, actually. So CO2, which produced in a biomass gasifier, it can be captured one process. Secondly, 
because what CO2 is producing, you have to also put so many plants actually to, to for the sustainable supply of biomass to the plant. So that plant will also absorb CO2. And people have done some life cycle analysis of this system. Actually, they found it is carbon neutral or carbon negative, actually. Because the CO2 which will produce, it will absorb. It's not the thousands year old carbon you are emitting, it's the new carbon. So that is why uh, in the deficient definition also, people are trying to put uh, hydrogen produced biomass gasification is, is it renewable hydrogen or green hydrogen? Sir, I would like to answer that a uh, little bit extra. Actually, yes, what you are using yeah. uh, CBG or our compressed biogas or whatever CB, uh, gas which is coming, which will be compressing some CO2. And on the reforming process, it will produce some, uh, it may not produce, actually, it will be a uh, kind of utilization process. So it's kind of by reforming so that you will uh, you'll enrich that hydrogen production and the CO2 is uh, negative or neutral, neutral side. So it, it's not a kind of reforming. So in general reforming, it is a carbon uh, positive side, but in the by reforming condition or uh, tri reforming, it is in a negative conditions. CO2 will be negative side. Uh, but so actually, uh, uh, as far as some uh, European Indian draft plan that, that is published last month, they already termed uh, biomass uh, feedstock as a carbon neutral. But in some journals already published uh, against this biomass specification, they told that the life cycle, uh, uh, life cycle, your uh, uh, emission is around uh, 39 to 90 gram of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt of uh, kilowatt hour energy. So it is not purely carbon Mr. neutral. Mr. Thakur. Um, yes, sir. This is director in the ministry. See, this this is an evolving field, so don't get into definition definitional aspects. This is going to change. So it is an evolving field. If you get stuck with the definition, how much is the carbon neutral, how much is carbon negative, it's going to be very difficult. What is today you regard as carbon negative? Tomorrow it might come out to be something new. So mm -hmm. paper printed today might be five years down the line it uh, might not make any sense so don't get into a definitional aspects what they are trying to say is it's a volume field they are doing uh, quite uh, well in terms of capturing that carbon dioxide and making it carbon negative i think he, if he's talking about uh, panipat refinery in panipat refinery they are capturing flue gas and converting into ethanol am i right mr uh, Bera? yes sir yes. we have to do uh, the ethanol plant actually yes yes so they are capturing flue gases. So it's not that overnight it's going to transform. Okay. Okay. So it's it's all about the definition, sir. Yes. Yeah. Definitional. See, how do you define green hydrogen? Today, if you talk about SMR, one kilogram of hydrogen emits close to nine to twelve kilograms of carbon dioxide. So now, what you will define as green hydrogen? Should it be three kilograms, two kilograms, five kilograms? There is no uniform definition. So let's not get, get into definitional aspects until and unless it is finalized. Yes. Okay. So it is like uh, with green hydrogen, low carbon emission uh, hydrogen. That is yes. also important. To that is greener. See, <laughs> Europe says that if you emit less than three kgs of uh, carbon dioxide per kg of uh, hydrogen manufacturing, it is green. Mm -hmm. Yes. So nobody is saying that it's going to be zero. But sir, they are timing as renewable hydrogen. Uh, if I'm not wrong, sir, uh, they are timing as yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying, now, But they're yes. still emitting three kgs of green uh, kgs of carbon dioxide, isn't it? They're allowing it. Yes. Yes. Any other question? Uh, there was a question uh, in the chat box. Uh, that is the what is the maximum extent to which hydrogen can be mixed with natural gas without warranting any change from engine and storage side. If any of the speakers can answer that. The presently yes. PC is 5%. The definition yeah, uh, is 5% and they are blending, I think, 2%. Yes. Right? So oh. I could answer that, sir. Actually, India has done uh, many experiments ranging hydrogen concentration from 2% to 25%. And what we have observed that 18 volume percent hydrogen which is actually two eight by hydrogen. There you no, don't need any modif modification of the IC engines, and uh, their NOx emission will be low, uh, low or, or negative actually. So you are talking about volume by volume. Eighteen volume percent in weight percent it is because it is a lightweight gas, 
so three o eight percent, two point seven o eight percent. ठीक है. Peso I think allows up to five. Peso up to allow up to up five, but for ACNG experiment we use eighteen volume percent hydrogen. The peso That's allow five percent hydrogen for transportation of ACNG in the pipeline actually. So that is With for bus. Distance, uh, that, that is, is for that is for buses, but when you are blending yeah. it with pipe and CNG, I, I think that is five percent, up to five percent, so, and sir, you are blending. In the experiment, what we have done at Rajgarh, it was eighteen volume percent. No, no, that 18. is for. Bus. I am talking about your CGD pipelines. CGD pipe, yes, yes. It is now uh, four to five percent, and I yes. think uh, what uh, CST has said right now, uh, there is a committee they are exploring whether they can put more hydrogen in that pipeline. They are doing some experiments or or some regulations. But, but how much peso has allowed you? I think it is five percent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So for the right. PNG network, it is two percent only, and for the PNG, it is up to five percent. Right now, they are allowing. Okay. Okay. So I don't think there is any more question. I would request uh, uh, Mr. Peso to kindly stop sharing your slides. Okay. Uh, now I would request uh, uh, Director uh, B R and our EDP Sherry to just uh, speak a few words. So thank you for joining late. Actually, I am in some remote areas, so I am on low bandwidth, so video is not working. So I first of all I'd like to thank you all for uh, giving your valuable time, Mr. Datta, Mr. Bera, and uh, uh, Mr. Bimbal uh, for giving us uh, valuable insights into what is happening in the hydrogen field. See, hydrogen is something which is going to play a very um, a critical role in decarbonization as far as India is concerned, not just India, throughout the world. And that's why there is so much buzz about uh, hydrogen and its importance. Already, as most of the speakers have said, India currently consumes close to uh, 5 million metric tons of hydrogen, out of which I think 90 to 95% is in the refining and fertilizer. Is this data correct, Mr. Bimba? I yes, think sir, sir. About this is the fact. You are right, sir. Okay. Right, right. Okay, so 95% is consumed by almost two sectors. So that's why there is a quite focus on refining and fertilizers because one of the panelists asked about the cost. So, as Anand Dattaji already pointed out, the example of solar, similar kind of thing might happen hydrogen also. And we are quite optimistic that it might happen because initially what we are focusing on is on those, those areas which are actually using hydrogen. And that's why the focus is on fertilizer and focus is on uh, refining. So but refining, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, I may stand corrected. It consumes close to uh, 2.5 million metric tons of uh, hydrogen it uses throughout India. I think this is the data we have right now. And for that, it requires close to 10 BCM of gas. But as far as I also understand, there are 30 to 40 percent of hydrogen that cannot be converted into green hydrogen because that comes out from the catalytic converters. But the remaining of them can be converted to uh, green hydrogen. Similar is the case with fertilizer. So the focus right now of the government is to initiate a process whereby those industries which consume greater amount of hydrogen take the initiative. Once the infrastructure is developed and the economies of scale are achieved, I think similar story as far as renewable energy is concerned would be written for hydrogen. So I'm not so worried about the cost. I'm I'm more optimistic and I see a challenge as an opportunity as another Taji stated and probably the cost is going to fall down and that is what is being predicted and that is probably what's going to happen in the future once this uh, infrastructure is developed. The uh, government is already taking a number of steps. I think most of the speakers have already said that one is the green hydrogen policy is out then recently the national green hydrogen mission which has allocated close to somewhere around 20,000 crore rupees has also been launched. And even in this budget, if you see, it's a kind of green budget where close to 35,000 crores of money has been allocated for green transition. So India is taking it the right step, but we need to understand one thing that it's not just about uh, using uh, a particular kind of fuel. The energy mix has to be suitable to the needs of the country. So going ahead, there would be ranges of colors not just in hydrogen, but in other kinds of activities as well. So we will require fossil fuels, we will require green energy, we will require renewable energy, we will require biomass, so all kinds of energies would be required depending upon the needs. But rest assured that we are moving in a way where the environment is not going, the future is not going to be just brighter, but also a greener one. So with that, um, I think, I thank you all once again for participating and 
giving us your valuable insights and we'll continue to interact in this manner so that there is a good amount of knowledge sharing between us so thank you once again and um, i think uh, pcr is also organizing a few more sessions uh, down the line in the coming weeks you are all invited to participate in those so i thank you once again thank you sir uh, i thank you all for joining this webinar and particularly the speakers for uh, sharing their valuable inputs acharya ji i would read yes sir जो अगली हमारे सेमिनार्स हैं उसकी डेट्स हैं आपके पास बिकॉज अदरवाइज यू कैन शेयर विद देम सो इफ दे आर इंटरेस्टेड आल्सो पार्टिसिपेट सर सर आई आई विल बी सेंडिंग टू ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स टू मेल ओनली सर विद द लिंक सर आई विल डू दैट सो दैट देयर इज अ गुड अमाउंट ऑफ डेटाबेस दैट इज क्रिएटेड नॉलेज शेयरिंग शुड बी वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपोर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट्स यस सर यस सर आई विल डू दैट सर ओके Uh, I would request all to just kindly switch on their videos for some time so that we can have a good photograph and then uh, we can uh, stop the uh, session. Please, I request all to kindly switch on their videos. आपका खुद का खुला नहीं है भाई? खुला तो है सर मेरा आ रहा है सर यहाँ पे नहीं दिख रहा मुझे तो नहीं दिख रहा वरुणा मैम हाँ